Hi everyone, welcome back to the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. Thanks for tuning in for the 4 o'clock news and politics show. Just cut up with Jennifer Lawless down inside the Beltway. Plenty going on down there between Roy Moore, Jeff Sessions' testimony today at House Judiciary, what's going on with tax reform, and of course keeping an eye on Korea. So we'll talk with her next Tuesday. As she said, it could be a whole new set of topics. But coming back a little locally here, We've got Steve Brown with the Rhode Island ACLU around the corner. He's been here before. Appreciate your coming in, Steve. Okay. I know you've got a busy you. schedule. I do, but so that's we'll, all right. <laughs> we'll talk right to folks because you sent the release out yesterday. Now, here we are. It's Tuesday. The shooting took place on Thursday. Did you really want to say, let me, let's the ACLU take some time to really go through what had transpired and learn new developments between the press conference on Friday, between the other one on Saturday, before issuing that release. Yes, we deliberately held off saying anything because there was a lot of confusion. People didn't really know what happened. I don't think it was clear to us what happened. Um, so we, we did want to wait. We did want to get more information. Uh, I think one of the big mistakes with uh, high-profile incidents like this is sort of jumping the gun, if I can use that term, um, and we didn't want to do that. Um, so we, uh, you know, we listened to the uh, news conference that the Providence Police had. Uh, we then waited for the, uh, the news conference that the state police had, and then we tried to put all that information together, and, and we thought that there were a lot of questions that remained. And what really concerned us is that at both news conferences, uh, the police officials all said that even though the investigation was ongoing, um, they felt everything had been done properly. And it just seemed to us that if the investigation was still ongoing and, and there were still all these questions, this wasn't the time to say it was clear that everything um, was fine. And so we, we really delved into the explanations that were given, and, and we just ended up with a lot of questions, and which is why we put together this analysis. So do you think, um, when you're seeing from those press conferences, I was at the one on Friday at the safety complex, is there a legal component to this from both the city and the state standpoint to at no time... Uh, give any specter of culpability? Well, I think, I think just about any time a high-profile incident like this happens, it's almost natural for top officials to um, uh, back up uh, what, their, what their officers have done. I mm -hmm. mean, I understand that, but at the same time, you know, the public has a right to know what happens, try to get answers to questions, and, and that's really what we're trying to do at this point, to, to get answers to questions. It's certainly good uh, to see... Um, that the Providence Police did release the videos and the body camera footage right away. Uh, I think as a result of all the criticism, uh, you know, the state police have finally released the names of the officers mm -hmm. um, who were involved. So there's more information coming out, uh, but at the same time, here we are almost a week later, and, and there still remain a lot of questions. So let's start, because you kind of went through bulleted items of things that you still have questions about, and one of them was a story that Go Local had done yesterday ourselves, taking a look at the chase policy in place uh, by the city of Providence, which has been around for years, um, providing that language. Because as you said, you know, we've gotten a timeline figuring out when uh, they knew Morgan had left the cruiser, they knew there was no uh, firearm uh, uh, on Morgan, and then they proceeded with this chase. How big of an issue is this, do you think, to review the chase policy, which, as, as we've seen, um, is to take any precaution on paper that they can to prohibit this because it puts civilians and other folks in harm's way. Yeah, I think that actually may be the biggest issue in all this, and it's one that's not gotten as much attention as, as the fatal shooting itself. Um, but you have to ask, how did we get to that point? And uh, for many years, uh, police departments across the country, including in Rhode Island, um, relying on data and, and other information, have generally adopted fairly strict policies governing uh, the use of high-speed chases because uh, there's been a recognition that they are extraordinarily dangerous. Um, the vast majority of high-speed chases are initiated against people who, haven't, who aren't violent felons. Um, it's often just because they've committed a traffic violation uh, or, or something similar. Uh, and yet the lives of many, many innocent people are at risk any time uh, a high-speed chase occurs. So you see policies like the one Providence has that really set some fairly strict limits on when police should begin chases, when they should continue chases, the circumstances under which they should stop chases, how many cars should be involved in a chase, and all of them point to this is really the rare situation, it should be a rare situation when we engage in a high-speed chase. 
And if you look at the policy and you look at the facts as we know them at this point, there are questions about whether the policy was, was appropriately followed. Um, it's unclear whether if Providence had initiated this chase, um, they would have had the authority to do so under the standards for initiating a chase um, in their policy. Mm -hmm. um, the policy says that uh, except with approval, there should be no more than two vehicles uh, involved in a chase at any given time. Uh, obviously, there were many more uh, involved, and, and questions are why. Why would you have so many cars involved, particularly knowing what we think they knew at the time, which was even if this was the right truck, mm. Um, uh, Morgan was not armed with the, the, uh, the weapon that had been in the uh, police cruiser he'd stolen. Uh, it's our understanding that the witness uh, who saw Morgan jump into the truck had told police that he was still handcuffed. Uh, so if, if they have that sort of information, you have to start asking, well, why, why did they go on such a dangerous chase? Now, what do you have to say? I'm going to deviate here from your list. And you've seen it in the court of public opinion that folks say, if he had just stopped, if he had mm -hmm. just seen the lights, and I'm talking about uh, <coughs> Santos here, the deceased individual, mm -hmm. when you see that, and that's a very common theme you see in yeah. social media, what's your response to that? Well, it goes back to the data um, that have been collected on high-speed chases, and, and what they find is that often these, these chases are begun in very impulsive ways. Uh, often it's very young people, teenagers, people in their, in their early 20s who do it, or in this case, as far as we know, you know, Santos just didn't want to have to confront the law again because of his past history, even though there was nothing violent in, in, in his past. So there's just a sense of impulse of people who just acting uh, very precipitously, unfortunately, and trying to get away from police. But that shouldn't serve as a death sentence. Uh, you know, that's the bottom line. Um, a person should not uh, flee from the police, and nobody's suggesting they should. On the other hand, that should also serve as a death sentence. So let's go to the use of deadly force here on your list. Now, from the Providence Police press conference that we were at on Friday, they showed the video, they showed the culmination of the chase mm -hmm. on that ramp in which they showed Santos in the truck, uh, hitting a truck in front of him, yeah. kind of T-boning it, and so the Providence Police said that was the reason for the justification for the use of deadly force that Santos himself had used the truck as a deadly weapon. So let's talk about that because there's multiple pieces. It's the chase itself leading yeah. up to these circumstances. So talk a little bit about this from a, a legal standpoint. Um, do you believe that he used that truck as a deadly weapon? And then at which point does that allow for the use of deadly force by law enforcement officials? Um, well, let me start by you know giving a caveat, and it's something we, we said in the report a number of times. We aren't making judgments at this point. We're asking lots of questions because there may not be a clear answer when all is said and done, but you want to have all the information available before you actually do decide whether things may or may not have been proper. And, and that's true of this as well. Uh, you know, I've seen the video. Um, the problem, at least the initial problem with the police department's explanation for the use of deadly force in these circumstances is that if you accept it, then what they're really saying is deadly force is okay anytime there's a police chase. Because the fact of the matter is the chase itself was much more dangerous to the public. You know, a car going 80, 90 miles an hour with a dozen or so more police cars right behind them going at that speed than, than when, the inc when the shooting occurred, when he was essentially stopped. Um, he was going zero miles an hour trying to get away from um, the block that the police had put on him. So if you, if you say that he was using the vehicle as a dangerous weapon then, um, I think you have to also argue he was using a dangerous weapon the whole time he was involved in the chase, which would mean you can use deadly force any time there's a high-speed chase. So that's a little problematic for us. You know, again, I, I don't want to discount the concerns, the legitimate concerns the police had, seeing him try to flee, but whether that justifies the use of deadly force is, I think, a question that, that needs discussion. So the use of deadly force, we did hear at the press conference, the 20 rounds by the Providence Police, 20 by the State Police. Uh, we have seen the names, and this kind of segues into the transparency part of mm -hmm. the issues that you had raised. We saw the names of the officers involved. How much information does the public get following an incident such as, the, as this? Now, we know that these officers are trained and incidents do happen. Do we know, for instance, who, you know, which bullet came from which gun that killed the individual? 
Well, certainly not at this point, as far as I know. I'm sure that's part of the investigation that um, the police are engaged in. I mean, they closed the ramp for many, many hours um, after the incident, um, and, and I assume that they were gathering that type of information. Um, again, the, you know, the questions are raised, was that use of force, uh, that level of force, uh, justified? If you look at the Providence Police policy, um, it specifies that you should not use deadly force uh, under those circumstances if there's a reasonable belief that innocent people might be harmed. And, you know, I, I certainly think it's debatable under the circumstances whether it was uh, reasonable to believe that there might be harmed innocent people. You know, 40 rounds uh, uh, of bullets uh, right next to a, a highway. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are public safety issues that really need to be um, debated and discussed because, again, I don't think it's a clear-cut issue that they clearly acted in accordance with the policy. And finally, an issue that we've talked with you about before is the use of police body cameras. It came up during the press conference on Friday. Mm -hmm. One individual not actually turning on, kind of accounting for human behavior, human error. These are all questions that came up about body cameras even before such as an incident as this. And they've just been implemented. Yes. And one of the findings that we saw from these videos that were shown was sort of what you actually see from a body camera. At some point, there's a sort of clear picture. At some point, if an arm is in front with a gun, you can see nothing but the arm. Mm -hmm. What kind of questions did these, uh, you know, ha do we have now following what happened with body cameras? Well, I think this this is a good lesson for the police. You know, it is a new technology. Province police have only just started implementing it. So I, I, I can understand, uh, you know, how these things happen, that, you know, somebody didn't, press the button twice uh, when they were supposed to do it twice instead of once. Um, hopefully there will be some lessons in terms of um, uh, everybody understanding better how they work, uh, perhaps also looking at where the placement of the cameras uh, are on, on the officers to prevent the sort of blocking mm. um, that we saw from this. Um, you know, I, I, do, I certainly don't fault um, the officers at this early stage for, for not quite getting it right. But I do, I do hope that the police will use, will use this opportunity to review their policy. One of the things that we've been raising for some time about the Providence policy is that it's not as clear or uh, doesn't draw as clear a line as it should on when officers should activate the cameras. Okay. And uh, hopefully they'll, they'll review the policy and, and hopefully strengthen it so, to prevent these types of mistakes from occurring again. So I think I've run down the litany of the issues that were raised in this release yesterday. We're here on Tuesday. Thursday marks one week from the incident. What do you expect? Are we going to get more information from the state police in particular? As I said, the investigation is ongoing. Is there going to be a press conference at some point in the future giving us more information? Well, that's only something that the, the police agencies can, can tell. I certainly hope that they will continue to release information uh, as the investigation continues. Um, because there are still lots of questions. Um, I, I, I do appreciate the fact that there has been a continuing release of information, you know, one bit at a time, but at least, you know, information is being released. Uh, and hopefully not in the not too distant future, um, we'll have a clearer picture of exactly what happened and what the results of the investigation have shown. So Steve Brown, a busy guy. I know you're taking off to East Greenwich, but give folks a little primer about why you're heading this evening and the concerns that the meeting should be even taking place in the first place. Now, this pertains to, if folks know, the uh, nullification of the appointment of Gail Corrigan as interim town manager. They were scheduling a meeting tonight to kind of readdress the issue, but was it pertaining to the posting of this meeting that's at the crux of it? Yes, um, the, uh, the town council fairly quickly after uh, Judge McGurl's decision, finding violations of the Open Meetings Act and other violations regarding uh, the appointment of Gail Corrigan as town manager, um, they scheduled uh, a, a town council meeting for tonight. And one of the items on the agenda is, and I'm paraphrasing, but I think I'm pretty close, is you know, ratification of all actions taken by Gail Corrigan during the period of time she was a town, uh, town manager. And uh, Access Rhode Island, which is a coalition of open government groups, including the ACLU, Common Cause, the League of Women Voters, um, uh, wrote a letter uh, this morning to town council members uh, asking them to postpone the meeting, cancel the meeting, because we don't believe that this uh, agenda item is, is in comport, uh, conformance with the Open Meetings Act. Um, it really doesn't give you 
any clear idea of what exactly they're doing. And I don't think the town council knows exactly what they're doing. They don't, when they say ratifying all actions of the town manager, do they have any idea what those actions are? Is um, it just a lack of information available to the council members in well, a timely fashion? Well, they need to know what it is that they're actually ratifying. I, uh, in theory, if they're ratifying all the actions, then they're ratifying the actions that Judge McGurl found were illegal. Um, I, can't, so, I can't imagine there's a rubber stamp that doesn't go through one by one and well, just says them all. Are you, when literally you leave here and go there, are you going to be lobbying, urging them, don't hold this because it could, even after the fact, be found null and void? Yeah, I, I mean, one of the ironies is to have this sort of blatant type of open meetings violation from our perspective as a result of a court decision saying that they would violated the Open Meetings Act. So I, I do hope they are going to reconsider. Um, there is no public comment um, on the agenda, so it's just they're going to do what's on the agenda if they meet. Um, but I, I hope they will um, carefully reconsider um, doing this because I think it will only get them into more trouble. Uh, I can't think of anything worse than responding to an, a decision critiquing the town council for vi blatantly violating the open means law and then return a week later and violate it some more. So what, in your opinion, would constitute a legal meeting if they actually delineated the actions by the town manager, and is the public comment necessary? Well, public comment is not required under the Open Meetings Act. I think it certainly would be a good thing to do in light of all the controversy that this has caused. Um, but yes, at a minimum, they, uh, we believe they do have to delineate exactly what actions it is they're ratifying. They need to know, and the public needs to know as well, you know, to just have this, you know, this broad-brushed we're just going to ratify everything that happened. Um, we don't think that cuts it under the Open Meetings Act. The Open Meetings Act really does require spe specificity um, so the public knows whether to go to a meeting and what, what the town council is voting on. Well, I know you've got to get down there as the meeting is still in place. So I appreciate it, Steve, that you're coming in to talk about your concerns with what transpired here. And I'm sure we'll be talking moving forward. Very good. Steve Brown, thank you so much. I'll thank let you. you run.